Welcome to another episode of Comedy Wham Presents with me, your host, Valerie, and in our first co-hosted appearance, we've got Laura joining us today. ComedyWham.com is your place to go for features about all Austin comedy, including those who come through Austin. We bring you articles and podcasts featuring the best in Austin comedy in all its shapes and formats. Started in 2016, the podcast project brings you funny people and their stories. As a fan, I like to delve into a comic's background and motivations, and we usually take a detour along the way. Consider the interview a way for you to get to know the folks that make the Austin comedy scene one of the best in the country. Today, we sit down with someone who's had a successful comedy and acting career before deciding to join the podcasting arena in 2012. We became quite fond of him because he is a comic, he interviews comics, all with more style, aplomb, and best of all for us Texas gals, a British accent. While he's interviewed household American names like Bill Burr, Hannibal Burris, Todd Berry, and Cameron Esposito, I've listened to a handful of his episodes with British guests, and the lessons in the comedy world appear to be quite universal. We've been very fortunate to watch him in action this weekend at South by Southwest, both performing stand-up and recording interviews with James Davis, Ron White, and Beth Stelling, and it was an immense pleasure to watch him in action. But as much as we're interested in his experience interviewing comics, we hope to delve into his very fascinating life as a comic. And now Comedy Wham presents our guest, Stuart Goldsmith. I completely refute that I had a successful acting career, <laughs> but uh, thank you for saying so. I did a little bit of acting and then very quickly felt fraudulent. So I, I'm not someone that's like, oh, I'm going to get into movies by a stand-up. I'm, uh, I'm, yes, I'm a bad actor. With well, a good we heart. appreciate you sitting down with us anyway. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, what a lovely introduction. <laughs> welcome to Austin, welcome to South by Southwest, and welcome to Comedy Wham Presents. How's your time been here so far? Absolutely wonderful. It's really? been really, really good. Yeah, uh, I, it's my first time here, and I have really been enjoying just uh, running from one, like running from a panel about podcasts to meeting fascinating people, <laughs> to watching a, an electric car inside an enormous plastic <laughs> bubble, bubble, which I was looking yes, at going, oh, I see the point they're making is that you can do that and live because there's no fumes. That's a really good idea, right? right? Um, I, I've never been to Austin before, and I understand that it is unique and not representative of the rest of Texas, necessarily. That's right. Um, That's correct. And, you know, where else can you hear 19 death metal bands all playing at once <laughs> down the, as you walk down a street next to the biggest cars you've seen in your life? So I've had a wonderful time. Shows have been great. People have been great. Love it. Where else have you been in the States? How are we, how are we ranking? Uh, I have been to L.A. a few times mm-hmm. to just go to a podcast festival there. And uh, I've been to New York, but not professionally. I've just been there uh, on a holiday 10 years ago. And okay. this is my first time in anywhere else in America. Nice. Mm. So now I can say I've done it all. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> all the coasts. <laughs> <laughs> right. We'll just put ourselves on the Gulf Coast temporarily. Right. There we go. Well, you're pleasingly in the middle. From my, pos- I mean, you're not right. in the middle yeah. middle, but compared yeah. to the, yeah, I feel, yeah. I've done it. I've done yeah. America now. Move on. Next. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like to kick off my interviews by asking one word to describe your past. Ooh, that was it. <laughs> that was my word. <laughs> okay. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, that will serve, actually. Um, probably, um, uh, uh, God, one, no, I'll, st- I'll stick with ooh, like it to, to infer uh, a slight element of surprise. I've done some quite interesting, no, I've done some unusual things whether or not you're interested by them is entirely you know I can't say they're interesting I certainly spent a lot of time trying to be interesting and as a result that led me into lots of different things some of which then became important to me I, I read that you had a start as a street performer that's correct yes uh, did you really learn how to walk on broken glass oh yeah 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 yes. <laughs> yeah that was the, actually that was the very first that was the very first first carny thing I learned I could juggle when I was 16 I got given a set of juggling balls for my 14th birthday and by the time I was 16 I could juggle (laughs) and um, uh, me and my best friend Noel saw someone walking on broken glass like a sort of carny you know sideshow stunt and we looked at it and we scratched our chins and we thought I'm pretty sure I'm pretty, pretty sure we've worked out the technique of how that performer is doing that without cutting themselves. So I should say that's, an, that's a part of the trick, is walk on broken glass without injury. 
And we thought, I think I know how it's done. So we went home and we just tried it. Like a couple of idiot teenagers, do not try it. <laughs> and, and lo and behold, we were right. And we went, oh, hang on a minute. Well, I can juggle and I can juggle fire. And we learned from someone, God, no, I can't remember how to do fire breathing. And wow. so we could walk on broken glass, fire breathing, juggling. We thought, that's a show, isn't it? So we went out and, um, and improvised a show. We were called Hot and Spiky Circus. <laughs> that doesn't appear in any press material. And I literally just remember that now for the first time in 25 years. Um, and, uh, and we could, cl- we concluded the show by, uh, Noel would lie down and put his face in the broken glass and I would stand on his, uh, on his back and on his head, oh. juggling fire, sort of surfing oh, in the broken wow. glass. And it was probably really bad and really derivative, but, it made people stop, and when people stopped in the street to talk to us, to, to watch, I found that I was able to talk to them. I surprised myself with my ability to, A, not be scared of them, B, improvise, and C, end up often saying quite funny things. And so that was a sort of a, oh, hang on kind of a moment. And I remember the very first, and I've told this story before, but I remember the very first street show we did, looking in this little bowler hat where we'd collected our money mm-hmm. and seeing, and I'll translate this, about $50, the equivalent of about 50 bucks right. from an afternoon's work. And I were very, I will never forget counting that money on the top of the bus home, looking at each other and thinking, this changes everything. <laughs> like we, we don't need to get real jobs, maybe ever. You know, and that was a huge, that was a really big uh, event in my life. That was a defining. Had you performed before then? Uh, yes. Well, I, uh, through Noel, I'd got into like a young person's drama group, but I hadn't. So we'd done a couple of shows like that, a bit of Shakespeare and a bit of, you know, this and that. But um, that was my rescue from uh, the weekdays, which were at a very discipline, disciplinarian school, which I hated. Mm. And uh, and so at the weekends I would run away and be a sort of pretend actor, I'm not a pretend, not to, not to denigrate youth theatre, but I would, you know, it, I was interested in like self-expression and girls, and there were girls there, and that was great, you know, and and I, I it was basically everything I did was basically showing off, so I was the one who would be more interested in trying to make people laugh whilst we're doing an important scene about so and so, and I didn't really care about being tragic. Or, you know, doing drama. But um, it was just an opportunity to, to make people laugh, really. So you can disavow me of this, but being British, the answer I would predict of, tell me about your earliest comedic influences, has to be Monty Python. But now tell mm. me the real answer. Sure. Well, that's, yeah, that's interesting <laughs> because lots of Americans, that is, Americans are... <laughs> Always very proud to tell me that they used to be into, or that, uh, that they are into, or were exposed to Monty Python. Right. And everyone calls it Monty Python. And uh, <laughs> that makes me laugh. But um, that was in there, definitely. I it certainly wasn't the first thing I remember being exposed to, but it was, I suppose, how, when were they working? They were working in the 70s, 70s. and 80s. So, yeah, I, the, one, the first thing I remember was called uh, Not the Nine O'Clock News, which was a uh, weekly topical satire. TV show with uh, Rowan Atkinson was oh, probably wow. the person in it who then became extraordinarily, mm-hmm. extraordinarily famous. Um, but uh, that was, and I remember, I remember discovering like an old LP that, of, of that of an album called The Hedgehog Sandwich, which uh, my parents had, and I listened to it and completely missed every single aspect of it that was a topical piece of satire or news. But it made me laugh, and some of it was the laughter of silly voices and some of them were jokes I could understand but a lot of it went straight over my head but I'd still go in and perform it the next day to my school friends and you know not pretend it was mine but I'd be doing lines from it that made me laugh and they'd look at me like well what does that mean and I'd go I don't know I don't actually know what it's about (laughs) so I'd be aping it and Uh bits of it were funny and bits of it were uh, were just me being excited that the audience the laugh track you know the audience in the studio were laughing and I didn't know why but I like, this is great anyway. Yeah. But Monty Python is obviously wonderful and enormously yeah. influential on, on, you know, it's, you couldn't have British comedy. It wouldn't be the same without Monty Python. They were one of those. Like someone like Chris Morris, who did a show called The Day to Day. I think in years to come, I mean, this is already the case, but in even further years to come, he will be someone who people go, obviously you're British, so you massive, you're massively mm-hmm. into The Day to Day. So, but yeah, there's huge, yeah. huge, huge, huge influence. So how did you make the jump into stand-up? The Edinburgh Festival. 
I would urge and recommend every single human being on the planet to go to the Edinburgh Festival. Probably not all at once, though, being administratively right. difficult. But um, it's the biggest arts festival in the world. It's completely open access. There are something like 1,700 comedy shows there. 1,700 mm. comedy shows, all on for a month. You, it, it would not be possible to see all of them. You wouldn't be possible to... You can barely scratch the surface and it's exhausting. But I went there when I was 16. We saw it with the drama group. We saw some loads of sketch shows, bits and bobs, and we saw some street shows. And we went, oh, we're street performers. Like, that's, these guys are doing what we're doing, but, but better. But we thought we were better. So we're like, oh. like the next year, we're going to go, oh, we'll show them. That guy only does three tricks in his show. We'll do 90 tricks. And of course, you went up and you, we realized quite quickly, oh, no one cares if you do 90 tricks, because actually that's not what's important. But I remember, and we talked about this, this came up a couple of years ago. I, I haven't missed an Edinburgh festival since. Oh, and wow. we'd go, we eventually became full-time professional street performers. And I would spend all of the money that I made street performing buying tickets to see comedy shows. Mm. So it took me a long time. I wanted to be a stand-up, but I was too scared of the idea of being heckled. It seemed impossible. It's, oh, I, I could never do that, obviously. So eventually, about 12 years ago or so, when I plucked up the courage to try it once, I, you know, I knew that I didn't want to keep being a street performer for the rest of my life. Exciting though that was, I felt that I had learned as much of the craft as there was for me to learn. Um, I, it's so exciting to do a new thing and, and I, was, I was so proud I would talk about nothing else but street performing for years I would convince try and convince all of my friends to become street performers you know as if, as if that was something they'd be interested in um, but it was it, I was so passionate about it and so enthralled by it and then it eventually got to a point where I went well partly I'm bored by this and partly I don't want to have to do this when I'm an old man so I want to broaden my horizons. And I thought, well, I've, I've been an actor for a bit whilst being a street performer, um, but very fraudulent. And then, uh, then I, I just tried one stand-up gig and went, I've got to, I've got to try this. I, this is, you know, I, I did it, and I remember thinking, it, it was a similar moment. It was a similar moment of epiphany of just thinking, oh, this is what I am. No. Oh, for God's sake! I've been for years. I've been doing all different variations on. Basically this, I basically wanted to be this, but didn't know and or was too scared. Huh, interesting. In the early parts of it, did you try to incorporate the street performance? Absolutely not. From I was advised to awesome. by other street performers. They said, just go take a trick on with you, just have something in your back pocket. And I was like, no, if I do that, I'll do it. I have to go on there with nothing. You'd be labelled as... Prop comic oh, not even that. No, I, would, I didn't even know there was a thing as a prop comic. Gotcha. I didn't know about the circuit. I just thought if I go up there to be someone who tells jokes and I've got a bit of shtick, I've got a bit of a gag or a self-working joke trick, whatever, in my back pocket, I'll fall back on that. Gotcha. Yeah, so I, I, I knew, I definitely knew. No, no. I mean, my street show was very free falling. If you see a street, but the sort of show I'm talking about is like, you know, it's called a circle show for two or three hundred people and you do 45 minutes and then before your last trick you ask for money and then you do your last trick and then they give you money. Um, and my last trick was, it, me and Noel were a double act for years, but when I worked alone, I would get ten guys out of the audience to do a tug of war with a rope and then I'd walk on the rope and balance in the middle and eat a packet of chips. And, that was, <laughs> and it was, I was deliberately doing something that wow. was stupid, low skill by street show <laughs> standards and low danger, and physically low down. All of those things made it hard. Really, what I should have been doing was juggling three fire torches up a 10-foot unicycle, which I was capable of doing, but I felt that would be cheap. <laughs> because I wanted, I wanted my street show to make me funnier. The bits I enjoyed doing weren't the tricks. The tricks were just there so people would stop. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do was improvise with people and make people laugh. Gotcha. And so... Uh, I forget the point I was making, but that's so. So it was the the show itself was kind of cheerfully rubbish. And some of it was original. A lot of it was hacky, stolen stuff that I'd convinced myself was all right to steal. Because the street, like, like in the way I, th I think of it, like um, hosts, comedy MCs. If you see someone do, okay, start the applause there and let's spread it around the room or whatever, that kind of stuff. It's all stock, and it, no one, it, no one really owns it. Someone wrote it once, but you know, maybe lots of people wrote it simultaneously. But we're all borrowing it. And that's acceptable within comedy, or more acceptable if you're a host, because hosting is hard and you have to make the room work for everyone. Similarly, on the street, it's much more acceptable to use stock material, because street performing is so bloody next to impossible. To, to, to will an audience into being from people who are walking past is so hard mm -hmm. that if you end up doing stuff that that's how you do it, you see someone do a thing and you're like, I'm going to do that, then that's kind of fair game. 
now I couldn't go back and do my street show because it would be like ashes in my mouth because now I turn over an hour or more material every year. It's all mine. It all belongs to me. And the idea of doing something which is basically a cut and shut of a, a standard joke, I, I couldn't bear to do that. How long into doing stand-up before you had dropped the performance? Oh, good. Well, before I, I... I started making a living from stand-up when I was four years in, three or four years in, which I think is quite quick. Um, but... Uh, the street performance. I was, I was kind of a cheat because I, you know, you see somebody who's been doing, I've been making people laugh for a living since I was 16. And, uh, and so that obviously gives you gears. It leads you towards a certain type of performance that then when you start doing stand up, you're not there trembling nervously looking at your bit of paper. I mean, I wasn't the first gig, <laughs> but you know, quite quickly I was like, oh, it's just an audience. Great. Well, I know I can talk to them. My material's crap, but I, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable being here. And the bit of feedback I would always get is that people would, or the, the, the review that people would always say is as soon as this guy walks on stage, everyone relaxes because you just think, oh, he's going to be fine. So that's good. As I then got further into comedy, I realized that I had to unlearn some of those things because they made me glib. They made me... You know, I was like, pow, you know, that's not stand-up comedy. That's not the comedy I wanted to do. I had to learn to be vulnerable on stage. I'm, and I'm still learning to be vulnerable because I had, you know, 10,000 hours or whatever it is of experience at being invulnerable mm-hmm. and powerful and, yeah. you know, zappy and all the rest of it. So that for me was the mission to try and unlearn all of that and actually be able to be myself on stage. Not to jump too far ahead, but you're talking about vulnerability. Do you find... You do an interview show similar to this one called uh, The Comedian's Comedian Podcast. Mm -hmm. Do you find that having done that show has made you more vulnerable? Yes, Because you do a lot of digging. Great question. Yes, it, it, it has helped me be more vulnerable, not just because I... Uh, not because, it, like, people often ask me, what have you learned from talking to 200 plus comics? Some of the best comics in the world. What have you learned from that? And I've learned comparatively little actual technical stuff that I put into practice. But I have learned that one of the things I've learned, I suppose, is when I slowly take my time and think about something and I'm interested, people care. I don't have to be tap dancing on stage. I don't have to be, look at me, look at me. There is, I'm still learning this all the time, but it makes me have a, a, a quiet confidence in something I do because people go nuts about my podcast in a way that they, they didn't about my stand-up. You know, I've always been a capable stand-up and only really in the last few years have I started to get what I consider to be quite good. Because, and that, that's all kind of tied in with that confidence mm-hmm. of like... I, I sort of believe in my ability to do it now, and that partly comes from the podcast, and partly from all the road hours. And yeah. The rest of it. Did you start the podcast thinking you would learn from? Yes, yes, I learned. I start the podcast specifically because I wanted to get a masterclass in how to do comedy from people that I thought were hilarious. Even though you were, at that time were seven years in. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Four I years in, you were getting paid. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I just I, I like learning, and um, that sounds like an awful thing. I like. I, I don't know about you guys, but yeah. I really like learning. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I suppose I'm, I I realise now that I'm incredibly analytical about things. At the time, mm. I didn't notice that I was, but now I I you know obviously I am. I <laughs> spend hours of my life researching and conversing, and you know that's just the way my mind works. That's one of those things you can't see the wood for the trees. You don't realise what sort of person you are because you're too busy being that sort of person mm-hmm. it turns out I'm amazingly nerdy about comedy you know so um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so he's um, in a pod right here <laughs> sure yeah absolutely you know I really enjoy talking at real length about stuff and because I've been going out to Edinburgh for the festival for t- 25 years this year I've seen an inc- I've, I'm pretty well I know quite a lot about comedy I don't know do I I don't know maybe I, in, in that kind of student way eternal, eternal student of course I know nothing but talking to a guest on my show and being able to say, yeah, I remember you 15 years ago at so-and-so, and they're like, what the hell? And like, yeah, I remember that because you said blah, blah, blah. And I remember thinking, well, how's, it, how's he arrived at that? Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, yeah. you know, there's a comic in the UK called Norman Lovett. And I said, oh, I remember you doing a bit 10 years ago about whenever you fall on the floor, you have a Kit Kat and you just like to stay on the floor and have a little Kit Kat. 
and, uh, and he, his eyes lit up and he went, I completely forgotten that joke. I'll put that back in. You know? and, uh, that was very satisfying. So what, at what point did you decide, like, I'm going to start interviewing comedians? Like, what... What started you? What gave you the idea to do I it? Realized, I realized that I hadn't done any training. Because I was always skirting around being a stand-up without realizing it, I did circus school. I went to circus school for a year when I was 18. Mm-hmm. So I could already juggle and do bits of street shows with my mate. And then I kind of went, oh, maybe that's what I'm going to do. I, I want to learn to clown and be like a theater clown. And I realized I didn't. I'm not very good at clowning. Um, and then I went and did a, an acting before I did an acting course I did like a three year theatre degree because I I just remember being pointlessly obsessed with I feel like I know how to perform but should I is it a worthwhile thing to do with my life so I went and did this head exploring degree for three years and then I did then I all the while street performing and enjoying that but also kind of yeah what am I you know just just completely introspective and self obsessed and it turns out there's a career path for that (laughs) Um, so so I suppose I had done all of these different types of training but I felt to myself, well, here I am. I'm a comic. I've been a comic for seven years. I want to get better, but I don't know. I've never done any training, and I don't want to go and do a comedy course particularly. So maybe I could have conversations with people who are brilliant and learn what they're doing, and maybe make that feel like my own school that I've created for myself, so I can learn. I didn't realise that loads of new comics would be interested in the show. I didn't realise that loads of existing pro comics would be interested in the show. That literally never occurred to me. And now I have a list of 75 people who started doing comedy in some part because the show, has, the podcast, has made them feel that it's more accessible or made them feel it's possible for them or inspired them to give it a try or made them realise that even the best guys in the world have imposter syndrome. I'm using guys in a non-gendered way. Um, even the best comics in the world have imposter syndrome or fear that they're you know, not good enough or what have you. And I really get into the nitty-gritty of that and that has made lots of people think, oh, I, I, I'd love to try that. And at least one of them is really good. You know, I'm not saying all of them are really good. <laughs> most of, really most good. of them I haven't seen. No, I mean the, the, the people who oh, the, the people comments. on my list. Sure. Some of them I'm sure are great. Some of them I'm sure are not great and shouldn't necessarily be comedians. But um, at least one of them I've seen. And I went up to him and said, hey, Man, that was so great. How long have you been going? Because he's obviously very new, but like mm-hmm. real kind of great ideas. Uh, and he was nervous to talk to me because he was like, oh, I sort of started because of this, like that. And I was, whoa, you know, great. So, so I have created a thing that isn't a school, but it's some sort of, I hope it's generous. I feel like it's generous. I feel like I can say that. It's a, it's a thing that helps people become more like themselves. And that feels like a really good thing to have created. Can I ask about a contrast? No. Okay. So, okay, you get it. <laughs> <laughs> so as a stand-up and as a comic and as a performer, your job is to talk and get attention and And I got a gilded control. cage. Sorry, yeah. Right. <laughs> and one thing, and I don't want to speak for Laura, but one thing I've, I've observed by seeing the three interviews you've done here at South by Southwest is you're an amazing listener. <laughs> you don't want to command control you put your question out there and you just let it sit and sometimes the guests might be uncomfortable with it and they don't know if they should go on but that's is that was that a natural thing for you just to tell yourself once I put the question out there I'm sitting back and I'm letting them was that a natural thing but yeah I totally agree with you that that is what I do I tr- I think. Um, do you know where it might come from? Where it where it might originate is shortly before I started the podcast. I was on a TV reality show for comedians in the UK, mm-hmm. which was bad, and <laughs> it made me. It set back my personal anxiety. I have a lifelong struggle with anxiety and mental health stuff, and um, it set that back by three years. I wanted to leave the show halfway through. I, I really didn't enjoy it at all. Out of all of the comics on it, I had the biggest. I was like, oh, God, what am I doing? This was a terrible mistake. I thought it would be full of interesting challenges. And instead, it was a bit staged and a bit like they encouraged us to sort of cheat because they wanted to get good gigs out of it. And I was like, what, what am I doing? This was crazy. One of the things they did was constantly interview us all the time. 
I'm going to say badly. Yeah, I think they interviewed us badly. They interviewed us badly by my standards of what I felt I could say. I didn't think they asked me any interesting questions at all. They asked me, are you nervous? How are you feeling? What do you think about so-and-so? They're trying to create a narrative. They were good questions if you're trying to create a reality show or yeah. observational documentary, as they highfalutingly called it. It's a fucking reality show. Um, so part of it was, when I started the podcast, I had a real sense of um, frustration that I felt I had been interviewed a lot and they hadn't asked anything interesting so I wanted to ask interesting things and I wanted to do a lot of research I perpetually one of the ways my anxiety manifests itself is I get very wound up days before doing podcasts doing interviews with people and it's really frustrating because it stops me I can feel it stopping me from inviting bigger and better guests I feel like oh what if they what if they don't like my questions what if they consider me a fraud all of that kind of stuff yeah absolutely of course um, so, so what was I saying? So anxiety, worried about it. Uh, what was the point? I'll get back to this. It's a good point. Um, I was, I wanted to do, I over-researched, I did loads and loads of research and because it's not about researching, it's about listening. I have realized now hundreds of episodes in, it's not about proving, you know, or, you know, it's not about, it's not about the danger of being caught out. It's about you know, caught out by your guest, like, oh, why didn't you know about so-and-so? It's about being present and it's about listening. So I just wanted to make sure I never interrupted because I had been interrupted a lot. And I also had this idea in the back of my head, someone who was like a salesman said, oh, the most important weapon in the salesman's arsenal is silence. So that was sort of in there. I, don't, I try not to use it exploitatively, but if you smile and nod and listen, people will continue talking. And very rarely they'll call, you call me on it and go, you're smiling and nodding again, and I've said all I'm going to say about that. Very rarely. Mm -hmm. Far more often, I will say, I'll try to say something intelligent and provocative, and I'll listen, like I don't prepare questions in advance. I like to listen to what someone says, and if they say, like remember the Ron White recording mm -hmm. yesterday, he said something about, I can't remember what it was, he said something about... Uh, it's a bad example because I can't remember. In the James Davis one. Can we edit that? <laughs> no, leave it in. Fucking leave it in. First rule of podcasting. Don't take all the, all the, uh, all the rough bits out That's of it, right. I think. That's right. Um, oh, so you were never going to give me the option of editing it? Oh. Um, so th I think the, the James Davis one, for, I remember, uh, same, ex same example really. He said something about um, it not being cool when he was, at, you know, kids were doing plays at school, mm -hmm. kids were doing performance, and he mm -hmm. wanted to do it, but it wasn't cool. And he said that in passing, and part of my mind went, blah, he, hang on. So I, he kept talking, and then I went, just to go back to this thing about it not being cool. And you could see him go, oh, yeah, right, because there was a thing turned up, and I went, he's glossed over that. I saw him reject saying anything more about that. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. Let's go in there. And if you are respectful and, and listen well people will let you in a bit I think I'm trying to grab their heart and squeeze so you have to go very slowly so they don't notice your fingers going into their molecules yep. every single one of the interviews we watched you do this time uh, all three of them at least at one point if not several points said after a long answer wait what was the question again because you were able to sit and let them just go. Yeah, because the question to doesn't the point matter. Where it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that was the thing that I found fascinating, is that you are able to sit with the silence, let them go, let them go a little longer, even if there's a pause, and you do get so much out of them. I heard you say in an interview, and I'm going to try to get this right, that you feel like you're an untrained man doing therapy with no regard for the consequences, and yes. I thought that was great. Yes, uh, that was an accusation leveled at me in a friendly way by a fan <laughs> of the show, or something along those lines, uh -huh. and I, that, that became the thing I say about it. Yeah, um, I care about my guests, I care about their mental health, I care about, I only have people on the show if I think they're great, mm -hmm. and... Where did that come from, like the mental health angle? Though? Oh, well, I, I've been in and out of therapy okay. for years and years, and uh, often... I don't think... People love this idea of the tears of a clown. People love the idea that stand-up comedians are all secretly depressed. The truth is, people are all secretly depressed. Mm -hmm. And stand-up comedians get to talk about it. And often we talk about mental health because 
when you are sitting down tr- or walking around or driving, trying to think of material or trying to articulate yourself, it is lonely and difficult and challenging. And you are also someone who, by the virtue of being on the show, obviously you're someone who is articulate and can be deaf with language and what have you. So it's interesting, it's fascinating to me to challenge people on their preconceptions of themselves, to challenge people on their happiness, to challenge people on the... One of my favourite answers was the pyjama men, who you may not know, um, they do festival circuit all over the world, two American acts, uh, two American um, sketch comics, character comics, and they do these brilliant, brilliant shows. And I said to uh, Shinoa, one of them, I said, um, are you happy? And he went, yeah. No! And no, I love that answer. I love that answer because you're so used to saying, yeah, I'm happy. How are you? I'm are fine, you? yeah. And equally, you're used to people saying, how are you? And you go, God, not so, oh, God, I'm not really, and then you realise that it's the wrong thing to say. So you don't feel you can express it. So I like to, I care about them and I, I want to, I want to help because uh, there's an element of me, like my, um, uh, there's a member of my family who has had very up and down, mostly down, kind of moderate depression for most of their life. And I always wanted to help. And at one point, I wanted to chuck in whatever else I was doing and become a therapist so that I could learn how to have my end of that conversation in a way that would help them more. Mm-hmm. And I have felt very sad and been depressed and been very anxious. And when people help, it's incredible. And when people can't help, that's awful. What a missed opportunity happiness is. What a, what a, like, there's, there's, you get one go at being alive. And all of the time I spent depressed feels like such wasted time. I could have been happy if someone had said the right thing to me in the right way and helped me understand. You can't tell people, you can't cheer people up. You can, but you can. You can cheer people up. You can't fix someone's mental health for them. They have to do it. But you can certainly provide some tools. People provided me some tools. And it's, my life is so much better and happier now. And if I can say to someone, a comic on the show, if I can say, someone said to me recently, a comic I, I spoke to recently said, we talked about whether or not they felt they deserved happiness. And they, they were talking about how I worry that if I get happy... I won't be as funny. And I didn't want to challenge them on it on the show at the time, but when we finished recording, we walked down the street and I said to them, you know, you, it won't, your comedy skills won't go away if you're happy. That's another, that's a racket you're running on yourself. That's another way your depression is making you, is installing itself in your mind, like a little lurking. It's like, right, if I tell him that he can't get rid of me because his creativity will be fucked, then he won't get rid of me. You know, that's, I want, I want to help. I am untrained. I'm good on the receiving end of lots of therapy, but equally I try to be quiet and generous and I don't try to tell anyone this is how it is. I just try and help people talk about stuff and the most satisfying moments for me are when I run into a podcast guest three months later and they go, you know, I was really thinking about what, what, what you said about so-and-so and I'll be thinking, I didn't say anything. You know? <laughs> um, but helping people arrive at those conclusions that then help them is is very is tremendously satisfying. Yeah, I feel very maternal to the guests that I talk to. That you know they're going through something, and and we I I personally tend to uh, not dig as deep because I I'm silver lining, but I always when I when some of that does come out, I feel very much like uh, I gotta hug you, I'm Mama Bird, and sure. Uh, you feel very protective of your guests yeah. in, in that way. Yeah. And you always root for them more afterwards. I mean, mm-hmm. you I've rooted for them before, but after I've interviewed them, there's a connection there that you can undo. Um, I am, I have to be careful because I do have a degree in psychology of not playing the get on the couch. We're going to get, <laughs> yeah, gonna get sure. into this. It's probably good that I am untrained because I, it means I have no professional ethics to worry about. So I, I always have to make sure, and I always tell my guests up front, I'm not trying to make you cry. We're not going to get deep into your childhood shit. You know, I'm not going to try to dig at you till you hurt. We're just going to talk. And whatever happens, happens, you know. But yeah, it's, it's a it's a connection like stand up is a connection um, that you just can't undo. Over the last year, you have taken on a new role as a parent. Last two years. Last two, two years. Two. Yeah. 
uh, how are you finding the balance of performing as a comic, managing the podcast, and parenting? I find it very challenging. It's been very difficult. The first year was very hard. Um, around about halfway, but around, around, around about when he was 18 months. I love him to bits. He's the light of my life, but I also probably resented the the removal of so much of my personal freedom. I was so personally free. Oh my God. Mm. I, you know, I was so independent and really lived that independence. Yeah. And, uh, so I resented that being taken away for a long time. I've had to make certain, of course, any parent has to make compromises. I also, I really had to compromise on where I lived. I used to live and work in London, and now I live in Bristol and work in London and all over the place. But that, that's the hardest thing now, is in order that we live somewhere where, where my wife wants to live. She wants to live in, in this, this, this 100 miles away from London. And she wants to live there. She always was living there. I was living in London. I thought we'd move to London. We didn't. <laughs> it's a great place, Bristol, to have a kid. It's a great place. We've got a lovely little network of local mums and stuff. And she's happy and he's happy. And that's great. I now have to be away from him. I'm on the road even more than I used to be. I wanted to be on the road less. Mm. I've got to go away working in order to feed him. And that means I can't be with him. And that was absolutely not the plan. And I, I am much more accepting of it now than I was. I was raging and stamping for a, for a year. Um, he is so perfect and hilarious and lovely that now that he has a personality, he was always lovely, you know, right. um, but he's the beginnings of, he's the, of a, he's, can you say he has the beginnings of a personality? Is that a massive slam? Um, <laughs> he, um, he makes it easier because he's such a great guy. So that's good. And when you are with him and your wife, you are probably even more practicing of the being present. You would hope so, but a lot of the time I'm thinking, oh, God, I've got to go away again. Or I'm thinking, I've got to work on the podcast. You know how, Mm -hmm. I mean, the podcast takes so much of my life to do. Mm -hmm. And I've got to write another show. I've got to write my eighth hour of stand-up for this festival, which has to be ready in August. And I'm here now having a wonderful time doing podcasts and being inspired by loads of stuff and that's all great but it's not writing me a show and it's not spending any time with my kid so it's hard enough I think to be a comic and spend time with your kid being a podcaster as well and having lots of responsibilities a ton of admin I I have someone that edits the show they physically put the stuff together but I've got to I've got to record all the stuff and do all the admin and invite all the guests and it's you know that's a one man operation and it's that's absolutely exhausting and I if I'm Parenting, I feel guilty that I'm not working on the podcast or my stand-up. If I'm working on the stand-up, I feel guilty that I'm not working on the podcast or parenting, and obviously the third one. You should start wrapping up. Uh, do you want to ask one final question before I ask my final, or should I ask my final? Um, well, I just have to say this, and, and I, I have realized that in every interview I always use the phrase full disclosure. I don't know why, hmm. so full disclosure. <laughs> um, we... Met Stuart at this festival, uh, South by Southwest, in case we haven't mentioned where we are, which we did. Um, and as soon as we saw you and saw what you did, we were like, this is like, like watching a master class in what we do. And I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to, to sit down and mentor us, essentially, because that's oh, what you've done. It's sure been thing. fantastic. Oh, yeah. So, no well, You're more than welcome. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we are the hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for coming to all the shows and making sure these people are, yeah. So my, my favorite closing question is one word to describe your future. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so we have ooh and ooh. <laughs> um, I, I'm always nervous about the future. I don't, you know, I, one of my, there's, I'm, I'm right, so this new show I'm writing at the moment, one of the very basic ideas I have for it is that it's, I, I'm absolutely behind where I need to be with the show but that's most of the year feels like that um, it tends to come together but <laughs> I can never rely on it um, one of the ideas of the show is that my life is so great why can't I shut up and enjoy it more why can't I be happy with it why can't I be content with all of these wonderful things I have 
And part of it is just fear. It's just fear. So uh, that's the, what's the future? Ugh. Like the future is incredibly <laughs> bright. I'm so excited to be here. I've got so much on. It's all great. I'm something that something that really has made a difference to my life. Is being a comedian is selfish. Yes, you make people laugh, but you mostly you're doing it for you because you like to make them laugh. You know, you want money and fame and attention, and the fact that they're laughing is a bonus. And, you know, the fact that they're laughing is addictive, and the fact that you're not damaging the environment or the topsoil or whatever, <laughs> that's just a, a happy bonus. You know, that's not why, why you're doing it. Doing the podcast and the reactions that I get from listeners to the podcast has unlocked this whole other thing in my life where I feel like I'm doing a thing that is really worthwhile. I'm not just pleasing myself. I'm doing a thing which makes people happy helps people make themselves happy and um, and that is uh, it's a really great thing <laughs> I, did, I, felt, I felt like I had more of a point to make then I'm just, I'm not, it's not a point I'm making I'm just like yeah I'm pretty great right <laughs> yes you are well that is a wrap on Comedy Wham presents Stuart Goldsmith Tell us oh, where to find I you. Felt there was a gap. I thought there was a gap where I, I should say something. I've taken the opportunity to have some pasta. Uh, tell us where we can find you on social media, recap uh, the podcast, mm. and how to find it. Cool newsletter, too. By, I just signed up for the newsletter oh, yeah. so that I can get your top ten, which, by the way, aren't American guests. I will say, if people are looking for an introduction, listen to the Bill Burr interview. I oh, listened yeah. to that today. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Oh, thank you. With a little bit of butting of heads. Yeah, yeah. It was very interesting mm-hmm. the way you dealt with that. Uh, so now, go on. Comedianscomedian.com. Uh, or you can follow me on Twitter at comcompod. Uh, or you can, I mean, there's got to be other things you can do. If you're, um, once you, once you get into it and, uh, and you find that you like it, there's a Facebook group which you can join on Facebook. And uh, that's a private group with about 6,000 people in it. And that's a really good community as well. So I, it's, there's lots of kindred spirits. And it's an incredibly positive. I, try, I'm very, I prune it. If people are dickheads, they're out very quickly. <laughs> um, it's a very positive community of people sharing quite high-level comedy nerdery kind of, you know. It's, you're you're, you're going to love it. You're going to yeah. love it. <laughs> Is that part of the Patreon? Um, no, no, oh, that's not. Um, that's I'm, because I've been to South by Southwest just now and seen lots of stuff and I've been giving it all away for free for nearly six years I am considering not paywalling but I'm considering extra content for members and stuff like that so at the moment people just donate to the show if they mm-hmm. like it but it's all everything is free for everyone um, that may change but it's it's even saying that out loud maybe it won't because I like it all being free for everyone but I've also got a toddler so um, right. you know Get in quick. Get in quick and download everything. (laughs) Get in behind the paywall. (laughs) We hope you've enjoyed learning about how Stuart got to be the comedic genius just as much as we have today. Be sure to visit ComedyWham.com. Give us a follow on Twitter and Instagram at ComedyWham and like our Facebook page. You can listen to past interviews on your favorite podcast player. Review us while you're at it. This has been Comedy Wham Presents Stuart Goldsmith. I'm Valerie. And I'm Laura. And I'm also Valerie. (laughs) (laughs) And that's been funny. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you.